Well, thank you so much. It was beautiful, you know. I look out, and especially those who were represented by those who received a, a little um, gratitude uh, offering. I look at them, I don't see so much people who serve or people who, I just see friends. It's such a beautiful group of people who have come together in friendship and been drawn together by master and by this great line of gurus and by their own desire to be connected and to be of help. You know, there's a natural tendency in all of us that we want to be useful. We want to be of, of some utility, of some ability to help. And yet, well, I'll tell a little story. Davy and I started uh, the first city center, big city center in San Francisco. And there was a young man who came there and uh, was very serviceful, very helpful. And he was quite a shy young man. And one day he came to us and he said, you know, I always felt that I had a lot to offer, but until I came here to Ananda, Nobody seemed to want it. And I think Master, above all, uh, wants that willingness, wants all of us uh, who want to be a part of his spiritual family to have a way to serve. That's in part why these centers, one, are so important, but also are so magnetic. You know, there's a law that Master gave which is the greater the willingness, the greater the flow of energy. And so the fact that you all come and are not only a, a part of the center coming here to receive, but because you come and want to give. We saw a beautiful little video uh, that was put together last night uh, of everybody, what, there must have been 40 or 50 people here last night who were setting up the rooms and uh, doing the little flowers and the painting and that uh, somebody wisely made a little video of it. But that willingness, that service, that energy that flows through the willingness, the other law that comes along with that is that with the flow of energy, it creates magnetism. Anytime if you have wire, you put energy through that wire, there's a there's a, a field of magnetism that surrounds it. The energy that flows through us creates magnetism around each of us. Master talked about this at length uh, in some of his uh, teachings about how really the, the greater law of energy is the law of magnetism. And he applied it in many uh, practical ways. But um, we, we don't really have time to go into that. But what I do want to say is that because of the willingness and because of the desire to help, to be of use, then master, and none of us have innate power as the ego. It's always God doing everything. But God needs a willing channel. Master needs a willing channel. If there isn't a willing soul, then God says, I'll just wait. I'll just wait because he set up this universe in such a way that our own innate yearning to get back to him, to get back to what we truly are, Satchitananda, to return to that state in our consciousness, that own innate yearning will force us gradually to open ourselves more and more to that energy of God and the energy that flows to us as we open ourselves. But in this sense, the importance of this center and of being here for 20 years, we've had 
especially Diana and Davy and I, we've had a lot of adventures in this center from, from the very beginning when we first got it. A lot of classes, a lot of satsangs, a lot of teaching. It's frankly, it's kind of like coming home to for us to come here. But the the fact that there's been so much meditation, so many classes, so much service, all of that magnetism that flows through has made this center magnetic. And now 20 years on into the process, you know, Swamiji, when he first came back to India, I'll tell that story in just a moment, but when he first came back to India, we landed in Gurgaon. Um, and somebody asked him, well, wouldn't it be better to be in Delhi? And Swami said, Delhi to a certain extent represents the energy of the past. Gurgaon represents the energy of the future. And Ananda, we don't want to be defined by that which is of the past. We want to be defined by the movement of energy into the future. And so we started in, in uh, Gurgaon here. That's where we, we landed. And then we've spread, of course, since that time in the last 20 years. Now we have centers throughout India and um, in many, many, many places. But <clears throat> some of you have heard this story, but not everyone. Before Swami came to India, he had come in the 1950s and 60s, and he had lived here for four years, and he always felt a longing to come back in many ways. He and others from Ananda feel that India is more our natural home, that we're Indian souls who, for whatever the reason, needed to be born in America, maybe so that we could be born there and learn some of the customs so that we could bring them back to India to, to unite, as Master said, the East and the West. In any case, Swamiji was living in Assisi, where we had a community at the time. And Davy and I received a letter from somebody, a, a couple uh, who were in India, and they were helping design the books of Master for distribution. But they wrote and they said, not much is really happening. We do some design, but there doesn't seem to be much energy to try to produce the books and to um, distribute them. Uh, is there any way that Ananda could help? And for us, it was just another letter. And Devarshi was in the office with us at the time. And so for us, it was just another letter, you know, a couple that we didn't know, making a little bit of a complaint about a situation that we didn't know much about. And we talked over with Devarshi and asked, do you think we ought to let Swamiji know about this letter? And finally, we decided, yeah, well, he should know. So we, we I, I don't know whether we copied the letter and sent it as an email or whatever. But anyway, he received it. About an hour later, we got this message from him. Can you come to Italy? I have something to discuss with you all. And so about a dozen of us, he called a dozen of us. And he said, when we arrived, he said, I've been thinking of going back to India after getting this letter. But I wanted to know what you all thought of the idea. Well, we had been around Swamiji enough to be able to interpret that. What he was saying is, I'm going to India. Are you in on this or not? And so, of course, we said yes. And uh, a week later, we were, we were uh, the advanced team was looking for places, and we ended up here in Gurgaon. And so Ananda in India, in this round, has really started here in Gurgaon. And this center is the um, kind of result of that. But as I say, it's, 
it's magnetic and it's important because this world, Master came with a big mission, a big mission, which is to uplift the consciousness of this world. We look around and we see so many difficulties and so many problems. And for sensitive people, it hurts the heart to be in a world that is acting this way. And yet there's no way to fix that by just stirring the same mud that's causing the problems. The, the, the consciousness has to rise. And so that's really the job that Babaji and these great masters, it's not like they were unaware of what was going to be going on. It was not that they were unaware. In fact, in the autobiography, uh, it says specifically that Babaji and Christ together, looking ahead, knew of the problems that were coming to the world and that they needed in Dwapara Yuga to send another teaching uh, that was appropriate for this age. And so this teaching has come in order to uplift the world. I don't want to be sectarian. It's not that God is using us Adananda uniquely. He's using whatever willing souls are wanting to be a channel for that energy to flow. But what gives this center the magnetism that it has and the, one might say, mission that it has is that we have opened our hearts, opened our minds to the flow of that energy through us. You know, we tend to look at the Bhagavad Gita and the Mahabharata in a little bit of a kind of a, I don't know, black and white way. And we think that it's a battle between the good guys and the bad guys. But it's not really that. Every character acts mostly in one direction, but they also have the opposite qualities just as everybody in this world is a mixture of these qualities. And so it is not so much the good guys against the bad guys, as it is souls who are making the right choices versus souls who are making the wrong choices. And that's the, to a certain extent, the dilemma and the message of what we're dealing with in the world. It's not that People are innately bad. People are, in fact, the opposite. We're innately children of God. We're innately spiritual beings. But people are making wrong choices. Not, not because they want to make wrong choices necessarily, just because they don't know what the right choices are to make. And so Babaji and these great masters, and then by extension, Swamiji, coming to master and founding Ananda, we're here to try to help ourselves, first of all, but then after we begin to make right choices, to help others also, at least to see what the right choices are as opposed to the wrong choices. And as we make those choices. I was just reading last night some sayings of Master, and he said that as we walk through life, it's as if we're walking along a path that has right on one side and wrong on the other side. And he said, two people can be walking on that path, and one chooses the right way and the other chooses the wrong way said, it's not that those souls want to choose the wrong way. It's that they don't have the discrimination yet to choose the right way. And so part of our job is to help in the training of the consciousness and the clarifying and laying out what are the choices. Now, why should we, why should why should we make the right choices? Well, 
It's as simple as this. Master said that every person in this world is motivated by the same motivation, the desire to be happy and to avoid pain. And so that desire to be happy and avoid pain lies at the heart of everyone. And so discrimination is really about being able to see what is going to produce happiness and what is going to produce pain. And it, it isn't always obvious, especially in the short term that, that, uh, that we're able to see life in terms of such minute, tiny little steps. Sometimes it seems like, uh, I don't know, lying and cheating at business in order to uh, outdo our competitors, like that's a good choice. I mean, maybe I get richer uh, if I do that. But gradually we begin to see the discrimination by making the wrong choices and seeing that that ultimately brings us pain because the soul is ever present. The soul is ever, one might say, observing, where our, our soul is observing our life and it is already unified with God. Our soul always is. And what we're really trying to do is get back to that innate soul nature. And so um, by making the wrong choices, that's simply part of the process. The soul sits back and kind of, just like God, uh, doesn't judge, doesn't correct, just lets, let them have the experience and they will see that one way creates pain and the other way creates happiness. And so we incarnate again and again in order to do that. But it isn't just the mind, just the discrimination. Master said that we have three major ways of interacting with the world. We have the mind, we have the feelings, and we have willpower or how we direct our energy. And so, yes, the mind receives these teachings and it has to begin to be able to discriminate between what is going to lead to happiness and what is going to lead to suffering, more suffering. So this center is dedicated in part to giving those teachings, to offering those teachings, because master in this line of gurus, they have laid out for us so clearly. These teachings are so crystal clear, and they've laid out for us that, that if you act in this way, it will lead to happiness. If you act in that way, it will lead to more suffering. And so uh, we need to give these teachings out to people because without that, people will continue to make the wrong choices. There's a kind of a humorous statement of this. Um, there was an old radio show in America, and there was this kind of wise old mentor and then this young fellow who was always getting in trouble. And so the young fellow comes to the wise mentor and he says, how is it that you are always able to make good choices? Is that the way? You always do the right thing. Yeah, how is it that you always do the right thing? And he says, well, the right thing is because I've learned to make the right choices. And yeah, and the young guy says, well, how, how, how do you learn? And he says, well, I learn through experience. And he says, well, how does experience help you by making the bad choices? And so again and again, we make the wrong choices and we find out and then we, we, but thank goodness the masters have figured it out for us and, and are giving us a, a shortcut to it. So discrimination is one thing, but it's, I would say of the three, the least important, the most important is the heart quality. 
that there's a we do a, a ceremony called the purification ceremony. And as part of that, there's a statement by the person acting as a channel. The, the statement is, the master says, open your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. And so it's not really our own discrimination even that we're using. The one most important choice is to open our heart to the influence of the guru, the influence of God through the mentor. And it's in that choice, that's the most important choice that any of us can make. The pivotal story for me, certainly, in the Mahabharata is when Arjuna and Duryodhana are both trying to get Krishna to help in the upcoming war once it becomes inevitable. And they both come and they both arrive at Krishna's home at the same time. But Duryodhana arrives just a few minutes earlier and they're told that Krishna is asleep in his bed. So Duryodhana goes and he sits proudly by Krishna's head, wanting that when Krishna wakes up, he's going to see me first. And Arjuna comes a few minutes later and he kneels reverently at the feet of Krishna. And so they're both waiting and Krishna, of course, it's all a drama. Krishna, oh, I wake up and he, Instead of looking to the side, he looks at the feet of the bed and he says, oh, Arjuna, what are you doing here in Duryodhana? Well, I'm here too. I'm here too. What about me? And Krishna, oh, well, what do you want? And they both say, well, we want your help. And you all know the story. It's one of the best known in all of India. And, and therefore around the world. But Krishna says, I will give one of you all of the material help that you can possibly have, my war elephants and my soldiers and chariots and armament and all of that. And the other, I will only give myself as an advisor. I won't even fight on your side. And Duryodhana is eager he says, well, I arrived first. I get first choice. Krishna says, no, no, I saw Arjuna first. And he gets first choice. And so Arjuna, the most beautiful statement of all for me, says, Krishna, I choose you because I know where you are, there is victory. And so... And, and of course, Duryodhana is overjoyed because he wants all the material things. It's the allegory of the of the soul and the, and the king material design. Um, but that's the choice that each of us, every day we're given that choice, maybe many times a day, in little ways and in big ways. Do we choose the spiritual light or do we choose some material thing? And it isn't always obvious. It isn't always clear. But over time, what we need to learn to do above all else is open your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. We need uh, Swamiji said, living with Master, he gave wonderful discourses to everybody uh, in large halls. He welcomed people. He talked with them. But among the devotees, he hardly ever said anything. He was just quiet. Among the devotees, those really seeking God, he said, there's only one thing that's important, and that's attunement attunement to my will. And that's Arjuna kneeling at the foot of the bed of Krishna and saying, I know that where you are, there is victory. For us, that translates into every time during our daily lives, 
we come to a choice of should I do this, should I do that, that what we need to ask is, Master, I have opened my heart to you. Please come in, take charge of my life and guide me because I've given you my heart. And if we give him our hearts, he will in fact guide us. And then the final thing is willpower. And so we can have discrimination, we can have guidance, but unless we're ready to act on something, not much is gonna happen. And so that again is why this center is important and why it's magnetic is because people, many of you sitting in this room and many, many others who aren't here have put their willpower, their willingness, the flow of energy into making this work, into making your individual lives, your individual lives as devotees. You've given energy to that. Master said, will is desire plus energy directed at, at a goal. And the goal is God. The desire is union with God or some variation on that theme. But then the third part is that energy has to flow. And the more the energy flows, the greater the magnetism, the greater the power, the greater the energy. And of course, that flow of energy needs to be guided by intuition and most of all guided by in, uh, attunement to the guru. But when you combine those three, the attunement, the, uh, the discrimination to choose the right path, the attunement to the guru to constantly be guided in that and the willingness to put our own individual effort into it. That's what makes the life of a devotee really work. And I see so many here who are working to the best of their ability to, to make those things work. And all of us have different, we're going to answer some questions in a little bit. All of us have different karmic circumstances that we're in. But the main thing is that our hearts, our desire, and to the extent that we can, our lives should revolve around that one single desire to be in tune with God and Guru. Ultimately, we'll get there, but why should we get there through suffering when we can get there through joy and satsang? I, I like the second <laughs> direction better. <laughs> so I'll also share a few words with all of you. Just in to begin with, we before all of you, most of you came, we had a meditation earlier with the people who helped put this on, the event on. And I wanted to say how touched I was to see we made some new acharyas, we people who have been serving for years, teaching, organizing giving time from already busy lives. And what impresses me and inspires me the most is that you all are willing to say, I'm not sure I, I know how to do this, but I will try. And it's, it's uh, palpable. You can feel that that's what you're doing. You're saying in all humility, in all surrender to God and Guru, I, I don't feel really ready to do this, but here I am. I remember the very first public talk I ever gave. It was 1979 in San Francisco. Swamiji was giving a very big public talk 
I'd done a few little classes up at Ananda Meditation Retreat, but this was a big public hall, maybe five, 600 people. Swami was giving a weekend program, a lot of publicity. And so he gave the program all day Saturday. And then there was also a satsang Sunday morning. And Swami, Sunday, Saturday night, he called up and he said, you know, I think it would be nice if you and Jyotish would give the talk on Sunday morning. And I, just like all of you, I said, okay, <laughs> I'll do it. And But in my heart, I was petrified. And I was thinking, I can't do this. There's 500 people up there. What am I going to say? I'll just, I'll embarrass everyone. I'll be look like a fool. I won't know what to say. Whatever you think, I thought. <laughs> and so, but I didn't say anything to Swami. So the next morning came, Swami said, I'll say a few words. You sit in the front row and then I'll invite you up. And so I was sitting in the front row and to my, um, I am not proud of this, but my mantra was, I can't do this. I can't do this. I, I just kept saying, you're not capable of doing this. But then the moment came and I could tell Swamiji was ending his introduction. And I knew there was a moment of truth. And I thought, oh, no. But then I felt, and I hope with all my heart that you all will have felt or will feel this, where I felt like a pipeline of love and support and inspiration came from Swamiji to us. And like he was taking my hand uh, in an energy way and walking me up on the stage. And I got up there and that was my first teaching that I did and I was totally calm. I don't know, I have no idea what I said, but it, it was the experience of saying, God, if you ask me to do this, I will do it to the best of my ability. And then you just give it to God. And that's what I see happening here. And that's the blessing you all will receive. You may think you're adjusting microphones, but it's much more than that. It's much more than that. God is using you. And then before I get into the serious part of my talk, I also want to share a little story. Jatish was talking about how Swami called us up from uh, Ananda Assisi and <clears throat> said, come over right away. I want to discuss something. And he had already made up his mind to move to India and start Ananda here. And so we were getting ready to go. We were actually leaving the next day, flying out from Rome to Delhi. And so I said, oh, well, I'd better pack. And, you know, here he is, leaving behind a whole life, that beautiful little house he had in Assisi, coming here, you know, needing all sorts of papers. And, you know, do you think, what, what does he need? You need to think it through and make lists. And he was like a little child. And we were helping him pack. And he was walking around his room and he said, oh, I like that pillow, that little cushion on the sofa. Let's put that in the suitcase. So he put the little cushion in the suitcase. Said, That's my favorite picture of Master. Let's put that in the suitcase. It was like a little boy, a little boy going to camp. There was no plan. There was no thinking it all through. And it was just, God, I am your child. And I will take this little cushion that I like, this nice little shawl, this picture of my guru, and I will go and do your work. And it was so moving because that's how he lived his life. And that's how we try to live our lives with that openness and trust and just say, I can't make plans. How how do how do I know what I'm gonna say when I get up on the stage? How do how will I know what to do when I get to India? But you just, you feel that lifeline of God supporting you. And you have, it gives you the courage to do whatever you need to do. Because God's doing it through you. And really, the whole point of life, I believe more and more, is just to realize that we don't do anything. It's just God. God's playing through you and me and everything that seems so, we have to think this through and we have to make the decision. 
That's just a total mirage. What's really going on is God has a, a beautiful story. And that story is your life and my life. And all we, he, it's sort of, I don't know if you ever you know, heard an interview with someone who was in a daytime soap opera. You know, they get their script every day. They never know what's going to happen. And that's what we are. We're in daytime drama. And every day God gives us our script and say, this is what you need to do today. These are the lines you need to say today. And we think we're in charge, but we're not in charge. And so one of the things I wanted to share this morning, because the topic is attunement and receiving inspiration, that the spiritual path is a long journey of perhaps many lifetimes. And we can't, ex we, we need to keep working at it, but we need to understand that there are long rhythms involved. Life and death come and go. And as it says in the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna asks Krishna, what if I don't succeed, Lord? What if I make a spiritual effort and I, I don't succeed and find union with you? Is it all lost? And Krishna are, uh, assures his beloved devotee, know this, Arjuna, no effort is ever lost. Whatever effort you make in one life, you pick it up in the next life. And you go on. And for many of us, I, I really mean this sincerely, you don't, we don't come to master's path as first-time devotees. This is a path for people who want to find liberation, who want to find God. And so if you are drawn to master as your disciple, know you have walked the path before. And this is the culmination. This is the fruit of efforts of many past lives. And we don't remember them, just as Krishna says to Arjuna, I remember my past lives. You don't remember yours, but they're there. But we get little intimations, don't we? Little hints. We look at Master's picture and we go, oh, I know you. I remember you. Somewhere, sometime. And when I, we first met Swami Kriyananda, he veiled his spirituality. He didn't want anyone to feel intimidated. So he seemed very normal, very natural. But from the very first day I met him, something in my heart, I was 22 years old, just out of college. But I just said, this man is going to do something great. And here we all are. And there are groups like us all over the world because of what Swami came to do and was able to do. But many lifetimes this journey has gone on. And a friend of ours told us a wonderful story a few days ago. We shared it with some friends yesterday. Uh, some of you remember Daljeet Singh, uh, wonderful friend. So we, he's up in Kashmir now. We were talking with him. He has two little grandsons, nine and four. And they're very, they love their dadu and they they sleep with him and he tells them stories. And so Dalchi was telling us um, they had a family dog, a little beagle named Dobi. And Dobi was with them for about 15 years and then Dobi died. And so Dalchi was going to bed with his two grandsons and the little four year old boy said, Dadu, where's Dobi? Why isn't Dopey here anymore? And Daljit said, well, Dopey died. He left the body. And the little boy thought about it and he said, well, when is he going to stop being dead? <laughs> and that's the point. When are we going to stop being dead? When are we going to wake up and say, I lead that life of getting and spending and disappointment and frustration and wanting to get this and being disappointed. I leave that life. I want to stop being dead. I want to be awake forever. And that's what Master came to give us, how to be alive. I don't mean in a physical body, but consciousness. In this moment, how to be fully alive, how to be fully awakened. And what is the journey? How to, what does it begin? It's 
we can think of it in terms of perhaps one lifetime. First, there's the, the, the youth or the springtime of the spiritual path, or maybe you find autobiography, maybe you take a level one class and you start meditating, you think, oh, this is easy, I get this. I'm going to just go for God and that master's right around the corner. And we have this youthful enthusiasm. I remember actually the very first time that I meditated, I was still in, finishing up college and a friend of mine gave me autobiography and I didn't know anything. I, you know, I didn't know how to meditate. I didn't know anything about yoga and nothing. But I thought, well, I, I want to try to meditate. So I went into... I was going to an American college and there was a church on the campus. So I just went in there and was meditating. It was quiet. No one was around. And I sat there and I felt this wellspring of joy coming up. And I, my friend was with me. who He was taking lessons in meditation, written lessons. And I came out and I was so excited. And I said, it's all inside of you. And he said, oh, no, no, no. You have to take the lessons. It's not inside of me. It's in these written lessons. And I'm like, oh, okay. I guess I missed the point. And, but the point is we start off with that enthusiasm. We think it'll be easy. And we're making progress. And then what happens? Then we come into youth begins to pass. We come into maturity. And then the spiritual path starts looking a little bit different. Because it's like, oh, I have to do this every day. I don't have time. How, how am I going to? I have to go to work. I have to take care of my children. I don't have time to meditate or chant or go to the center for classes and then it becomes like a slogging you just have to slog through it and we, we think and this is and I say this to you because it's a turning point in many people's lives where they give up this is too hard and I'm not getting what I thought I was going to get that is the turning point between people who continue to the end or who give up and if you give up, you won't have lost what you tried, but you'll have to pick up again. I remember also one time, maybe I was at the ashram at Ananda Village four years, something like that, and I went through a, a slump. And I just was discouraged. I didn't feel like I was making any progress. I didn't, I, and I really was thinking, I'm going to leave the spiritual path. I, it's, it's too hard for me. I can't do this. So that was... 50 years ago, just to put it in context. And, and then I got sick. I was, we were, our, our life was very, very simple, if one might say primitive in those days. We lived in little bitty trailers or cabins. We didn't have running water. We didn't have electricity. We didn't have heating. It was, and I mean, not to mention phones. I mean, there was nothing. And so I got sick. And I was, I had a fever. I was in this little trailer I, all by myself. It, it was, it was a hard time. But I thought when I get better, I'm going to leave Ananda. I'm going to go back to the world. This is too much for me. And so I, I found some silly novel that I had. Someone had let me and thought, okay, I'll read this novel. It was just silly. And so I started reading it and I thought, this is boring. And so then I picked up another book. I picked up a book about uh, one of my favorite books, Kim, by Rudyard Kipling about India. I started reading that. It was a little more interesting. But I put it down. And then finally I looked up on my shelf. There was the Bhagavad Gita. And I took it and I read it. And I thought, you know what? No matter how many times you run away, no matter how many times you get discouraged, you're always going to end up back at this point. Why waste time? Just keep going. And I did. I got well and I said, I don't care if I never make progress on the spiritual path, Master, I am not going anywhere. And that was the turning point in my life because I proved to myself that I was committed. I proved to myself that this was important to me. And so for all of you, to whatever degree you hit that point where you say, I'm not making progress, I'm too busy, um, 
those fanatics at the center meditate too much, whatever it might be. Thank you, Mickey. Um, <laughs> we, we have to, if you can push through, Master will say, well done. Well done, my child. You saw what the test in front of you and you passed it. And so that's sort of the middle period of the spiritual journey. And then finally, and Jatish and I and many others here, not many, but a few others, I won't name them because it'll embarrass them. We've been on the path for 50 plus years. And I just want to tell you, it gets better. If you can get through the doubts and the resistances of the ego, you get to the point where you just start feeling God and Guru's presence with you. You have a thought, you pick up a book and there's master's words telling you exactly what you needed to know. You have, you think about Swamiji and you so one of his songs will come into your mind that exactly tells you the answer to what you're thinking. And meditation starts becoming something personally involving, not techniques, much more than techniques. But it becomes something that engages you and that you feel, oh, I'm talking, God's with me and I'm talking with him. And please understand, I'm not saying this in any way to say I'm special or we're special. I'm saying it only because this is the spiritual journey. As Master said, no one goes home empty handed. Those who, see, and this was what he said those who stick with me till the end. And he said, I don't mean just sticking it out out of kind of, you know, kind of uh, not putting your heart into it mechanically. But those whose master said, those who stick with me till the end, I, master, or one of our line of gurus will personally usher you into the spiritual world, into the astral world. That was his promise. So the main thing I, I'm wanting to share, yes, 20 years Ananda in India, it's a moment in time, a blink of an eye, but a lifetime dedicated to God takes you out of the moment by moment challenges of life and you begin living in, as Swamiji said, the eternal now. Where time isn't that important, age isn't that important, problems aren't that important. All that's as important is God's presence guiding you within and around you. And so join it, join this band of brothers and sisters who love God, who are serving God. You will not go home empty handed. Break through the moments where you think, I don't want to do this anymore. Everyone hits those walls. But if you just push through and say, Master, maybe you walk away from me, but I will never walk away from you. And of course, he won't walk away from us. But just to affirm that over and over. This beautiful poem that Master used to quote, The Hound of Heaven. It was, it's a long poem. There's a recording, a voice recording of him reciting it. It's quite beautiful by Sir Francis Thompson, if you want to refer to it. But the very last lines are, the hound of heaven is God pursuing the devotee. That's the imagery. And on and on it goes. And the, the uh, devotee tries this and that doesn't work out. And, Tries that and that doesn't work out, but the hound of heaven relentlessly, God relentlessly pursues us. And then the very last paragraph or so, stanza or so says, um, everything I took from your arms, God is saying to the devotee, I took not for that, everything I took from you, I took not for your harm, but that so you would find it in my arms. So the things we seem to lose in life, God says, come, find them with me. And then he had the last, uh, found, find, fondest 
blindest, weakest, God says to us, it is I who you seek us. Come, take my hand and rise. And this is what God is saying to us. He sees our weaknesses. He sees our doubts. He sees our fears. And he says, come, take my hand. And we will walk together to journey's end. And so this is the spiritual path. It's a wonderful adventure. And it's a blessing to share it with people like all of you.